Okay. Here we go. Three, two, one. Boom, and welcome to the Big Honker Podcast brought to you by Gun Dog Outdoors. I'm Jeff Stanfield with the world-famous Andy Shaver. That's right. And on the line with us today, very excited to have him, Mr. Hank Shaw from bright and shiny Northern California. Hank, we're excited to talk to you, sir. Thanks for having me on. Um, so I guess the first thing I want to talk, so y'all have had record setting rains out there in California. Um, but Tool Lake is totally dry still. Uh, yeah, because it's a big state that's a thousand miles long and it doesn't rain everywhere at all at once. Did, so they haven't had the rain up at Tool Lake? They have. Um, and I'm actually not sure if Tule Lake is dry at the moment. I'm guessing it's not, but the, the issue with Tule Lake and, and Klamath it's kind of a long-term deal rather than that. That's never fed just by rains. So there's farming issues. There's environmental issues. There's native issues. There's it's a, it's kind of a big mess up there. And I, I know a little bit about it, but just enough to be dangerous. Right. Yeah. That's kind of, that's kind of where I am. I was led to believe that it was still, it didn't, it didn't uh, fill up, I guess I should say. I don't know if it's totally dry either. So I'm, I guess I'm kind of like you. I know just little enough to kind of sound like a moron about the thing. It's all California problems. Yeah, it, it's also <clears throat> damn near six hours for me, so it's a ways away. Yeah. I, I want to ask you a question before we get into the Tule Lake deal. Are you a 49ers fan? Got to be. So, historically, no. Uh, I'm from New Jersey, so I'm a New York Giants fan. Um, oh. And I am, despite the fact that we got beat down by by the Eagles, um, <laughs> I, I, you know, now that I'm, I'm, I've licked my wounds, I've, my hangover is cured. Um, it was a damn good season for us, and I'm very happy. Great I would, future. I would have liked, I would have liked to have not have been beat down, but eh, what are you going to do? Now, as far as the Niners are concerned, I normally hate them. However, um, I'm kind of a fan of of George Kittle, and just for that reason alone, I'm like, eh, you know. And besides, as a New York Giants fan, I, I hate the Cowboys. I like, I, I'm. I was born and born to hate the Cowboys, and I continue to hate the Cowboys. So the enemy of my enemy is my friend, if you know what I mean. Yep. Me and you got a lot in common because I hate the Dallas Cowboys also because I grew up a Redskin fan. But I do like the Giants. My youngest son's ah, a Giant the fan. Ah, the foreskins. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> the, the Giants have a great future ahead of them. They do, have, they do need to sign Daniel and Saquon, though. Yes. Yeah, from your lips to God's ears. Yep, that's that's got to happen. But it was great to watch the Cowboys lose. I just can't. Oh. Can't, can't deny that makes me feel good. I mean, if I could have like a pay-per-view of like a hundred bucks a month and I could watch the, the greatest defeats of the Cowboys <laughs> with like a split screen with the owner, just giving it a gas face every time Dak Prescott or someone or Tony Romo or someone throws a, a, a an interception, that, that would be worth a hundred bucks a month, don't you think? <laughs> yeah, I, I would pay that much for it. I'd love it. I'd also want to see Skip Bayless thrown in there because that makes my blood, makes me happy to see him such a whiny ass. Mm, yes. Yeah. Like a double split screen. Just I, I it's even better. Oh. Now, now you were a political reporter for a long, long time before this lifestyle that you're on now. I mean, what uh, I'm trying to think of how to phrase this. It, it seems <laughs> like the last eight years, it has just been a shit show from one political uh, scandal to the next. Are you kind of missing that life or are you very, very happy that you're out of that life? I'm really happy I'm out of it because the reason that I was very interested in politics to begin with was when I started, oh, when I started, get off my lawn. Uh, <laughs> when, when I started in the 90s, uh, politics was very much about people from different uh, geographies, lifestyles, and, and political outlooks meeting in a house, either a state legislature or the Congress, hashing it out, mm-hmm. figuring it out, doing things, compromising, debating. Uh, and so from a reporter's perspective, it's really cool to cover that because you're, you're covering the art of the deal, essentially like right. what's who's going to win, who's not going to win. But, but you knew that things would compromise and something would happen. And the debate was always really interesting because you would have people genuinely change their minds from time to time. Well, as we all know, for the last 20 years or so, that's been not really the case. So it doesn't necessarily like, it doesn't matter what your politics are. If the two sides are, are basically shouting past each other all the time. That's just boring, right? So who right. wants to write about like side A says side B is a poopy head. Side B says side A is a you know eats babies and like who cares? Like it's just it's dumb. 
Do you think that we'll ever get back to this more uh, central, you know, mindset of, hey, let's kind of work this thing out rather than uh, we're going to dig our heels in on everything that the opposing side says? I actually saw a little bit of that in the last election. So the, the 2022 election, if you I, I still look at the stuff a lot because I'm a member of kind of like a you know how like everybody bets in the basketball pool and in, in NCAA's. Mm -hmm. um, me and a bunch of other geeks uh, bet on elections, and so what happened last year, if you look at it na nationally, is that the the not crazies did better than the crazies. Mm -hmm. If you look at the whole country, so I I view that as as positive, you know, and, and I think. <laughs> if we don't start talking to each other, um, bad stuff's going to happen. Well, what, and we've talked about this because we, we talk a lot about politics and we lean, you know, favorably more right, just being from, you know, kind of where we grew up. But um, now all of a sudden the Republicans control the House and they're mm -hmm. talking about term <laughs> limits, <laughs> term limits and getting rid of the IRS. But where was that talk when you had, because if I'm not mistaken, did Trump had, we had a Republican president, Senate, and House. Like, where was that mm -hmm. talk when you could have done something? They about don't want to do anything. They want us divided, and they, they get rich, and they don't do shit. And that's but that's what I'm saying. It's more of this game bullshit rather than it actually is fixing uh, a problem that you have. Because now they're all about it, because they know it's not going to go anywhere. Right. There's a... Um there is so there this is a deep conversation um sorry <laughs> structurally structurally the electoral system has created it with with aided and abetted by us the people because we have tended to sort ourselves into places that we want to live that we're surrounded by people who think more or less like we do whereas when i grew up in the 70s and 80s your neighborhood typically was very mixed. So you'd have a Republican on your right, a Democrat on your left, uh, you know, an independent across the street and blah, blah, blah. But what's happening is the incentive in elections for people to move to the center is, it has been diminished in, incredibly. So what happens is, let's say I'm a Republican in, um, in a middle district, right? So I'm, and I work, so let's just say I'm a Republican here in California and I'm working in, in the legislature. So the Dems run the legislature. Historically, my job would be to make Democratic bills suck less. So my job would be to work with the Democrats to cut off all the rough edges on their, on their legislation by compromise and debate. That's historically what my job would be. And the same, you know, you can flip the parties in the same deal. However, uh, what has happened over the last 15, 20 years is that if I do that, somebody is going to primary me from the right, calling me a traitor because I'm talking to the enemy right. and, and I'm a squish, I'm a rhino, blah, blah, blah. And so I get bounced out of office. So the next person comes in and, and that person's to the right of me. And then that person gets primary from the right because that person has figured out that, oh, well, I don't want to just throw bombs all day long for two years. I want to try and do something for my constituents. And then they get punished for it. And then the cycle continues. It's it's pretty depressing if you if you want to think about it. And I would much rather talk about geese. <laughs> yeah. It but it is a this is where we are as a country. And I don't I don't know. I I've got a, I'm kind of like you. I've got a pretty depressed outlook on uh, politics in general and I just I'm scared of what's going to come down. You know, I got two two small kids. I got an eight and a four year old. So, who the hell knows what we're going to be looking I, I, at? I'm going to break the years. ice on the on the on the po politics. I want to ask you about truffles. There you go. We're okay. going back to food. I don't know a damn thing about truffles other than they're expensive. The guy asked me about it the other day, and so we started doing some talking around here, and I kind of looked it up. Truffles are not native to America, except there's a little bit around Oregon. Is that correct? Mm, ish. So. The black and white truffles that are famous are all from Europe. Mm. There are truffles all over the world, though. And because they grow underground and because for up until very recently, at least in this hemisphere, only the squirrels have been eating them, um, you, people think, oh, there's no good truffles. But there's actually – there's a pecan truffle that lives wherever pecan trees lives. It's really quite good. There are the two different kinds of Oregon truffles, and there are a good half a dozen other that, that we've discovered in North America that have that kind of 
amazing aroma. Now it's not the same as an Italian or a French truffle, um, but but we have our own, and and people are starting to discover it. What I mean, so this was something that was brought over, or the the black and white truffles. It was brought over from Europe, and what what did they? I mean, was it only reserved for the high class and upper class people over there for all these years? Uh, sort of. It's a little bit like us as wild game people. Uh -huh. So if you think about our lifestyle, we eat ducks and geese and, and venison and all this kind of stuff just because we do, because that's what we do. Now imagine if someone went out there and bought duck and goose and venison, they would be spending an arm and a leg, right? Right. Well, it's the same thing with truffles in Europe. So if you live in a truffle area in Europe, in Italy or France or wherever, I mean, truffles are just like, ducks for us we're like yeah yeah let's put some more truffles on that because that's they 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 live where truffles are are collected right they get expensive when you move them to the cities mm -hmm. right now how has your duck season been uh, as a whole have you primarily spent it in uh california or have you traveled a lot i'm actually having a uh, I'm taking a little bit of a break from ducks this year because for a lot of reasons, but um, one is that our freezer is quite full um, Two, um, Holly, my girlfriend, um, she is a serious, serious, serious duck hunter. And so like, the, like I do lots of things. She is primarily a duck hunter. Mm -hmm. And so with our freezer being in the situation it is, uh, I actually took a bit of a step back to let her, because otherwise we're, you know, we get to the middle part of the season and we're like, for the love of all that's holy, stop shooting anything but, you know, primo ducks because we don't have any room in the freezer. And and I didn't want to be a part of that this year. So Holly is getting ready for the last week of the season and, and she's having a pretty good season. But the what's going on, and you'll see this in a lot of flyways, is Slovember for us has is bled into December. Yeah. So Birds are changing their habits. They're changing their their rhythms, and it happened. I mean, the you know she started shooting lots of ducks by the end of December, but um, it was really grim through the end of October and all of November, and even into well into December. And that's unusual. See, it's backwards here for us because <clears throat> we get a lot of speckle bellies. It's primarily what we get here in Texas anymore. Um, so November we get the calendar birds. October 15th, they're here no matter what weather pattern we're seeing. And then anything past December 10th or so is all whatever cold weather we get. And mm. we didn't get any cold weather until right before Christmas. And it was only here for a day. Um, so November and to mid-December is usually lights out for us. And then you get to Christmas in January. If you've had warm weather or lack of snow anywhere, you're going to struggle. So the last month here has just been agonizing. Mm. I mean, I know a, uh, he's a friend of mine, a guy named Larry Robinson. He runs an outfit called Coastal Wings yep. and it's called Coastal Wings because he used to be based in Bay City, in yep. Texas. Uh, but he picks up sticks and moved his operation to Oklahoma because the birds kept short stopping. Yep. And the hunting is infinitely better where he is in Oklahoma than it was in Southeast Texas anymore. Yeah. They hunt the same area in Oklahoma that we do. <clears throat> yeah, there you go. And so, um, do you? Okay, I had a loss. I had a damn thing question I was going to ask and lost lost my damn train of thought. I'm getting old, I guess. But here. that's how it was a long time ago. South Texas used to be. They used to be our bit. So we're in North Texas, and then mm -hmm. they back when Jeff Jeff started this business, Sanford Hunting Outfitters, and South Texas was his biggest competitor. And then, you know, we all know what happened. You know, you got subdivisions where it used to be rice fields. So obviously, mm -hmm. you know, the snow geese aren't going to go there. Anymore. Follow the food. Follow the food. And then, but I don't know what it is. I don't know if birds, I know what it is, but I also know that birds are going to travel the path of least resistance. And if they don't have to leave South Dakota and Nebraska, they're not going to. And I think that snow is the biggest driver for a good migration. Yeah, I mean it's it's climate writ, writ large, it's weather writ small, and it's uh, agricultural practices. Yeah. So those three things can really, really, really affect um, any kind of habitat and any kind of habits. And you know, here's a fun fact: apparently, snow geese didn't figure out grain until right after the Second World War. 
What they eat? So they they all went to the bayou. They all the snow geese in your flyway spent the entire winter right on the coast in the bayous. And because if you look at their mouths, they're filters. Mm-hmm. Their yeah. mouths are built to kind of root in the in tubers and things at the base of t- you know tules and cattails and that sort of thing. That's what they're meant to do. And at some point, let's just call him Bob. Bob the Snow Goose figured out in like 1946 or something like that. I don't have the exact year, but some shortly after World War II, they decided, uh, hey, this corn stuff's pretty good. And they started to visit the fields more. And and that's why you have the explosion of, of snow geese in terms of population is they, they you saw an, a, a really, I mean, what I would call it an evolutionary change yeah. where they switched from natural forage to agriculture and and ag has pretty much determined that you know their population all the way up till the the tundra where they breed and then the, the, there's so many of them they're ruining their own uh, nesting habitat i'd never thought i've never heard that theory before or would that, that, or be that the, fact but that's interesting would that be and i guess a shoveler's kind of that way too isn't it if you look at its mouth it's kind of like this like the like a gill also isn't it mm-hmm. so, and i mean you so still don't really see them in, in a um, field ever Spoonies are are like they're built to eat like little invertebrates and algae and stuff like that, which is one of the reasons why they're not fantastic to eat. Right. However, where I live, they can eat rice. They don't always eat rice, but but every now and again we call them a white spoon. So if you shoot a spoon and you you pick the feathers off the breast, um, and it's white. If it's fat and white, then you keep you keep <laughs> plucking. Um, if it's yellow or orange, you skin them. Because uh, the presence of yellow or orange in, in our case means they've been eating invertebrates and algae, um, and they're going to be stinky, you know. But they, but they're not all stinky. They're they're stinky in most like Klamath. We were talking about Tule Lake before. Mm-hmm. Uh, they are notoriously smelly up there. Really, just because of their diet. But where you There's are, a very, they, they very, very specific good. algae that lives in the Klamath area that that gives them that stink. So let me ask you this: How long would a would a spoonie have to switch its diet from invertebrates and algae to rice or or a grain of some sort for its fat content to to switch and for it to be okay to eat? Do you have an answer, or are you just gonna kind of guess like I would? I'm gonna guess because I don't know the exact answer, but I would say it have to be at least a week. Oh, that's short then. Oh, okay. Well, that's so. Yeah, you know, it cleans out their whole system pretty quick. Right, and then every yeah, I, th- then the the. Do you know guys who like trap? You uh, know, because I know guys who trap possums and eat them. Yeah. Yes. And so the guys who trap possums and eat them, they'll trap them, and then the the quote is, "I got to feed the nasty out of them," and that only takes about a week. Yeah, my dad that used to tell sense. a story about my grandmother. Would they would trap mm-hmm. a, a raccoon, and she would bake a raccoon, and they'd trap it, and they'd feed it for a week and for, of, of corn and stuff, and then after a week, then they would kill it and eat it but it would take a week to clean it exactly out. i bet that the, was yeah that's, that's, that's what I'm, I'm basing my guess off of right back on back to the snow geese so the snow geese used to winter in uh i'm assuming louisiana it'd probably be the mm-hmm. area and that the, held, held, the whole gulf coast yeah and and probably the texas area around beaumont and stuff and eagle lake mm-hmm. and then the, they started planting a lot of rice after world war ii and then that's when the snow geese got in there and now that the snow the rice they've left the rice fields there and they go to arkansas which is 600 700 miles difference but that's the majority of the snow geese go now is in southern Ar- or in middle of Arkansas to where mm. the snow geese. So <clears throat> in the next 10 years, we're going to start seeing a lot more solar panels and stuff in, Oak- in, in, in Arkansas. That rice production is going to go somewhere else and start growing more. So, and, and the snow geese are going to follow it. What are you basing the so- solar? They're starting to plant. They're starting to build more of them up there for some reason. Oh. And, and they've taken out like 10,000 acres of, of rice production for other things. Louisiana's got sugar cane. I wonder if Louisiana went back to rice if those geese would go right back there again, right off the bat. Geese and ducks? The geese and ducks. Because that's what's hurt Louisiana's hunting more than anything is they plant sugar cane. <clears throat> yeah, sugar cane, is, uh, sugar cane is to Louisiana what almonds uh, and orchard crops are to California. Yes. Um, it's, a, it's a high money crop that does, isn't very good for wildlife. And... Um... We had a guy on not too long ago. He was an almond guy. Big money in that. If you can ever get your foot in the door, it sounds like. But yeah, it's very capitally intensive. But shit for 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 hunting because it takes it takes a lot of the water too. That's mm-hmm. big. One of the big water battles in California is the almond water, isn't it? It is. It is. And they're doing. Uh, some- and it's really not so much a battle over the over the 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 crop itself. It's the fact that. Some very large percentage, I don't know the exact percentage, but but more than half 
of California's almond crop is sent overseas. So there's the argument that you were using California water to, I mean, yes, it makes money, but we're using California water that we need for communities and for, you know, uh, um, row crops, you know, like a truck farm mm -hmm. uh, that, that Americans would eat to send it to China and other places like that. So there's, that's a particularly um, strong argument in the, in the, that particular water fight. There are lots of water fights in California. It's the gold standard. Whoever's got all the money and gold gets to do it the way they want to do it. And that's what's happened. <laughs> Pretty farmers. much. Now <laughs> that's pomegranates. So uh, a, a billionaire uh, 20 years ago, maybe it was, I don't know. Uh, decided a billionaire from LA decided it, he was going to diversify and started to grow pomegranates. And so he acquired an enormous amount of water rights in Southern part of the San Joaquin Valley. And the reason why you have Palm Wonderful uh, uh, and why Americans in general can eat pomegranates is because of that guy. I'll be damned. So he changed the whole market by just himself. He created it. It used to be like, you, you know, 30 years ago, you could only get pomegranates at like a Persian market and good luck finding one. Mm -hmm. As a kid, we used to have a neighborhood tree that had pomegranates on it. And I think it was in the fall. All the kids, we'd go steal one out of this lady's yard and we'd have pomegranates and we'd take them to school. But other than As that, you, you didn't see pomegranates <laughs> ever anywhere else. I mean, it was just a, about a month out of the year you could get pomegranates if you stole it out of Miss Beasley's tree. That was the only time. <laughs> it is the. It, it's funny you say that because I have a friend named Elise, and she's got a pomegranate tree in her front yard. And every year, someone steals pomegranates from her. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but now you can buy them at the store. Before back then, you when I was a kid, I'm 54 years old. Kid in the 70s, you didn't see pomegranates in the vet produce aisle of the store ever. Exactly. Now, I did not know that. Kefra. It's pretty interesting. Those now, are what, a pain in the ass to eat, though. What, what's the story? Well, it's because we don't do them right. If you watch on TV, they well, cut them out. Well, you eat crawfish, don't you? Yep. It's, yeah, begrudgingly, shut though. Up. Yeah, begrudgingly. <laughs> exactly. what, what's, I, and I say the same thing. I'm like, I'm going to order crawfish, and it's going to be a pain in the ass. It is a pain in the ass. What, what, <laughs> what's, at least you're consistent. <laughs> what's the story with the bees, though? Because the almond trees also, they're, they're, they're causing something to happen in the bee population. Am I right on this? So, uh, again, I know just enough to be dangerous on this one. Um, the problem isn't the bees. The problem is moving the bees. So uh, what's happened is there, there's a lot of things that are affecting bees in terms of diseases and mites and sort of things like that. And, and so when you, it's, it's essentially like, like any disease. If you move a population that might have it, but you don't know they have it, to another area with bees that didn't have it, they're going to they're gonna catch it. So the the way that we run pollination these days is that beekeepers have all these boxes and they will literally truck their boxes all over the country so that the bees can pollinate whatever crop you know the 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 industry pays them for. And you know almonds are a big one and because almonds are about to bloom. So they they typically bloom somewhere between now and St. Valentine's Day and if there's no bees around there, you have no almond crop. So what people from the South and Texas and, and Arizona will be driving to uh, California to, to put their bees in someone's field. And, you know, I mean, think about it. A lot of, a lot of things don't like to move around a lot and bees are one of them. That's, I wonder if there's a lot of money in that. Jeff. There's big money in that. <laughs> there's a lot of money in it. Yeah. But there's a lot of, there's a, there's a Netflix thing called rotten, I believe is the name of it. And it's oh, about, yeah, I've it's, seen some. it's the bees and it's about the honey. And those people are, they steal from each other and they'll, they'll trash someone else's bee. It's a, it's a big business, but that's, that's what, and bees, people that do not, un, do, that do not follow this, do not understand how important the bees are to our welfare of us surviving. Well, that, somebody oh, has yeah. said, like we're gonna go as the bees go. Yep. When the bees are gone, we're done. It's funny because there are lots and lots and lots and lots of bees that are doing just fine, but they're not as um, industrious or prolific as the European honeybee, which is what we're talking about here. I mean, we've got I don't know 15 different kinds of bees here in California, but they're not. You know, they're not. There's not going to be a big swarm of them, and they're they kind of work slower, and and it's interesting. It's like the the European honeybee is the hypercharged pollinator bee. Now, honey, that's it's a byproduct. What is it exactly? Isn't it like semen or something like that? Or something? No, weird? it's what they use to feed their larva. Oh, okay, that's what it is then. Mm -hmm. oh, I was thinking of like what, bee what's, poop or bee semen. What's or the number one honey state? I don't know. Montana. Why? Is it? I'll be damned. I, I, I don't know why, but when you go through Montana and I looked it up, there's bee hives everywhere. 
Those bee huts like we the, saw in yeah, Canada? Yes. The, the, no, those were the those were to keep the bees. In Canada, we hunted in Canada one time, and they had uh, big huts in the fields, and it was so the carpenter bees would have a place to survive during the wintertime. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. But the uh, in, in Montana, everywhere you look, they got those white boxes with the beehives in them. And, mm-hmm. and M- Montana is the number one honey state. Oh, I'm saying this. I'm probably really screwing up, but I'm pretty sure I read that one time. Just enough to be dangerous. Yep, I'm going to look this yeah. up. <laughs> do you get your own honey, or do you get this from a store? Me? Yeah, you. Oh, I just I go down to the farmer's market. There's an old Greek lady who, who lives down the road from me, and, and she's, she keeps bees, so I buy her honey. That's what I would do, too. For, for, and I'm not getting stung and all that other stuff. It seems like a whole lot of work. No, I have um, several instances where I've been squirrel hunting, and I've stepped on a yellow jacket nest, and Ooh. so I'm a little bit PTSD about that. Yeah, yeah. No, it's not for me. Even, like, I think they can even, like, get under the suit and still sting you. So, like, when you think you're safe, you know, all of a sudden you're wearing that big, goofy suit, and they're still getting after you. North Dakota is the largest honey producer. Montana's second. <clears throat> ah, okay. So you weren't that far off, Jeff. I don't know. Just, just a couple of inches in some places. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so... You've got a picture on on your Instagram, and you're you've got a uh, a bunch of spoonies. How did what were those spoonies like? Did they have the the good fat, or was it the bad fat? Oh, those guys. Yeah, uh, those guys were we skinned them. Yeah, they were not. They, they didn't have the good fat. But and then, you know, you always check. And then what do you do with it after that? You just put it in like a stew or something. So the meat of a so the meat and giblets, the breast meat and the giblets of any off duck, whether it's a spoon, a sea duck, a diver. Uh, or whatever, any any bird that you consider to be off. And and there are cases where, like a good example is uh, a widgeon. Yeah. So widgeon in most places are a good duck, but in some places, because of their diet, they're really awful, smelly, gross. So anytime you have a bird that fits into that category, my general rule is to take the breast meat and trim every little scrap of fat off it. You have to be very diligent about that. And then you take the, the, the giblets, so the heart, um, the liver, and the gizzards, and you trim the fat off that. So if you've ever worked with any heart, there's a fat cap around the top. Yeah. And you trim that off in a, in a stinky duck because it's going to add that stinky flavor to, to whatever it is that you cook. But the rest of it's just meat. Same thing with the gizzard. Um, and then you just you go from there. And I have tried to use legs from smelly ducks and you can, like, if I was, if I had to, yeah, I'm sure it, it, they're edible, but there's nothing that you can do where you won't get that little twang, mm-hmm. if you know what I mean. Yeah. So uh, we have a we have a barn cat that lives in the backyard that likes to eat the legs of spoonies. <laughs> you know, it's funny that you brought up the widgeon as being an off duck in certain places. I've always widgeon are some of my favorite ducks to shoot just because they decoy so well. But they do. They're very obliging. They are. Yeah, they make you feel like a hero. Um, even if you're not, which in most cases I'm not, but, um, they are on a lot of feedlots around here and I've always just, I've always loved widgeon and, and, but now that you mention it, like that's gross. I wouldn't want to eat that. Well, I mean, if it's a feedlot, they're eating grain. Yeah. But they're also like in around all the stinky, they've been like in the pens and stuff with the cows. Could, could be worse. You know, the old joke about a golden eye. Mm -mm. So the guy's like, oh, man, this gold knife's going to be great. Look, it was eating corn. I'm like, brother, <laughs> wasn't the first person to eat that corn. <laughs> it's eating recycled corn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, no, I mean, I've never thought, I've always, because we shoot them in, like, big wheat fields up here. So I've mm. always just, I mean, I guess they would taste like grass then. I don't know. Yeah, I've, e- I've eaten them from Oklahoma, and they're good. They are? Whenever they mm-hmm. eat, whenever they do that? Um, I've never had a duck that tasted good, so see, there you go. Yeah, Jeff's not a duck fan. If only you knew someone who had written an entire cookbook about ducks. What everybody says, we've had, uh, <laughs> we've, you know, we've had a lot of chefs on. I've had a lot of people. That I, can I cook. mean, you do know that I wrote the book Duck Duck Goose. Yes, right? yes, yes I do. Yeah, okay. But I just, I'm not. I don't. This is the thing. People cook a duck and they say, "Man, I can make it taste just like beef." Well, then I'll have beef. I'm just not a duck eater, and and it all boils down to my dad was a terrible duck cook. I grew up as a kid, and we ate what we killed, Roasted and we duck. we shot a lot of fucking ducks. But you so eat you're, a, you're traumatized, is what you're saying. I Ro- ate a lot of duck. oven roasted s- stove duck that a dog would not eat. <laughs> you can't put enough. Could you enough imagine, could a, you imagine a, a, a a spoonie baked for like two hours? <laughs> yes, I can. <laughs> Jeff's at it. That's I why can. he doesn't eat duck now. 
<laughs> I ate. I did eat some duck in Mexico a couple of years ago at a French restaurant that was really, really good. I I don't think it was duck. I think they were lying to us. But it was very no, tasty. It was, it was duck cooked properly. It was very, very good. And I was really, really stressed. And me and my wife are going to that same resort in two weeks, and did, we're going to go eat there, and I'm going to order it. Was it duck or what? Now, it was, was duck. it duck or was it that foie gras? No, it was no. Now, am I pronouncing no, it, that right? Yeah. No. Not close enough. This yeah. was, this was I'm duck. I'm from Texas. This, this was duck. And it, it, it was, was, it, was duck. it was, it was duck. And it was very, very good. And I was really surprised by that. Because it was an appetizer, and I took a bite, and I was like, "Shit, that's pretty good." So I'm going to order it when we go back there again. I'm going to go to that restaurant and eat again. Huh? But a lot of the so ducks the, that I, I s- the iron rule of duck is this: the iron rule is this: cook the breasts like a steak, cook the, everything else like brisket. If you if you forget everything else from this entire podcast, if you remember to cook duck or goose breasts, medium rare, medium, however you like your steak, and then cook the legs, wings, or whatever else. Like you would cook a brisket, slow and low, mm-hmm. you'll be fine. Now, a lot of the duck that I see prepared, like on the cooking shows and stuff, it's not that dark, deep red like we see off of our wild game. So, could mm-hmm. that could that factor into how maybe his duck tasted at this resort? Yeah, I mean, chances are the duck he had at the resort was a Pekin, uh, which is the Aflac duck. Yeah, um, and they're lazy. I mean, think about think about someone who sits on the couch versus someone who flies three thousand miles. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the 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 thing about any wild game, with very few exceptions, is it's going to be smaller, more muscular, denser, tougher, and older than its domestic counterpart. Now the now that doesn't mean it. It actually the 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 thing that you get from that is that it's also more flavorful. So I would much rather eat a fat mallard breast than a Pekin duck breast because it's it's there's more of it, even though it looks the same size, it's denser. The fat is gonna be not as huge. Like Pekin duck fat can be, you know, unmanageable. It's they're so fat. Mm-hmm. Um and it's still gonna be tender because you're gonna cook it medium rare. Right. This was this one had a lot of fat on it. This one was really tasty. Sure, it was a Pekin duck. I think they had it. They, I think it was some kind of <laughs> swap, some swap, beef or swap something. Beef they lied to us, swap but it was but it was very good. It was very very good. It, are are they? Do they still do the uh, and g- give me the correct correct pronunciation? The foie gras because that's a pretty unethical practice to get the duck that fat, isn't it? Not really. Uh, it's a, kind of a big myth. Uh-huh. So the thing about waterfowl and many birds to me, but specifically waterfowl, is you can't eat and breathe at the same time because we use the same pipe for both reasons, right? Of course it it diverges, but, but unlike, unlike us, a waterfowl can eat through their gullet and breathe perfectly fine at the same time. So um, they will actually go to the extra food and they will actually do this by themselves. So I actually have written an article about wild foie gras because it happens in the wild. And I guarantee you, you guys are big duck hunters. I'm sure you've seen this. Have you ever seen a duck or goose liver that is like the color of your skin, like tan? I've seen, yeah. I mean, pretty close. That's that's foie gras. That's so, it in the wild. Yeah. So the, the medical term is steatosis. And it's basically, it's a fatty liver. And you don't want it as a person. Right. Uh, <laughs> Alcohol. But what? But what water? Well, it can be alcohol. It can be a lot of things. Uh, it can be too many funyuns or, or you know, too much Whataburger. Um, but in waterfowl, what they do is they eat and 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 eat. Because guess what? They're about to fly sometimes nonstop for thousands of miles. So they've got to put on calories and fat any way they can. And the, one of the ways they do that is to store fat in their liver. So. That is a natural occurrence that happens normally. Now, you could argue that people have taken the process farther than it would naturally, and you would you would be correct. But it's not like the ducks and geese are dying because of it. I mean, they're dying anyway. They're you're fattening up birds for the slaughter. Right. So the process is called gavage, and gavage in and of itself is not cruel because it doesn't. It, it doesn't look like what it, it looks like something that it isn't doing. If, if that's right. probably the easiest way to put it. Right. 
so the videos that you see on YouTube, it's actually it's it's not as bad for the duck as what because you know we we tend to put uh, how we how we would be as a human. You know, if somebody shoves that food down our throat, you know, you're not gonna be able to breathe. So actually, if so, I'm glad that uh, that got cleared up because I did not know that uh, they could do this all at the same time. Look, kind of like a barbaric mm-hmm. process. I wonder how so that they have a, came they breathe about. through a, a, a there's a little an entry underneath their tongue is how they breathe and then they their gullets are on top of the tongue. <clears throat> I wonder how that that dish came about. That guy just ate a duck that had been eaten from the grain bin, I guess, and he was like, "Hey, if we just feed it, they'll all taste like that." Probably I mean and this is total guess. Yeah. Um the Egyptians started it back in the pharaohs. So the Egyptians kept geese. So they domesticated the goose. And so I would be willing to bet that sometime in the Pharaoh times and thousands and thousands of years ago, when they were eating the goose, they would eat it all. And so the livers would be tan because they're, they're kept, they're, they're, you know, they're fed the wheat from the Nile. And they would notice that the livers would always be, would always be tan and that, that they were delicious. So I, it, it's not a far stretch to find the one in there. Cause you know, I mean, if you have a bunch of animals, you know that one of the animals is usually going to be a glutton. Right. And <laughs> yeah. you know, we've got, we've got two cats and one cat of ours is absolutely obsessed with food all the time. Uh, so, I mean, you're going to have that with farm animals too. And they're going to notice that, that the really super fat goose, that one had an even better liver. So I think it's not a very s- difficult, you know, mental leap from, raising waterfowl to begin with to figuring out that, oh, if they get really fat, they're going to have this better liver. And man, is that liver good. Right. Now, how did you make the leap from political reporter to what you're doing now? I mean, you've said in, in other things that you taught yourself how to waterfowl hunt and how to, how to duck hunt. Like, how did you make this transition? So I've always been, I've always been a gatherer of wild plants and mushrooms, and I've always been a fisherman like since, you know, before I could think. Mm -hmm. So that part of my life is of the outdoor life has always been there. And I've always been interested in food and I've always been a good cook. And, and I worked in restaurants before I was a newspaper reporter. So I have professional kitchen experience. So that also helps quite a bit. And the way I made that transition was sometime around 2005, 2006, um, as we mentioned before, politics was getting more and more boring and dreadful and awful. So I was looking for something to do. I was looking for something to keep myself sane, to be honest. Mm-hmm. And so I decided that I wanted to be uh, a food writer. And I very quickly determined that, number one, the area that I was best at was wild foods. And and by that time I had already started hunting. I started hunting, um, 2002 and this has been 20 years now. And wild foods seemed to be a niche that a, I was very good at and B, uh, was open. Like there wasn't a lot of people doing that. Right. So I started Hunter Angler Gardener Cook, which is my website in, uh, 2007. And it's been going ever since. And then you started out as as kind of like this outdoor blogger. Is that is that have I got that right? And then it kind of took took uh, fire from there. Yeah. So I started the blog in 2007, and you know the the initial couple of years was just I was all over the place. Um, but I very quickly settled on no, this is going to be a wild foods space. And you know I was hunting a lot, and you know I mean you, I don't think I bought meat or fish more than a handful of times for the house since like Oh five. So I pretty much subsist on fishing game and wild stuff. And at least for the protein on the plate. And that's, that will give you a lot, a lot of time to, to be able to work on recipes, to be able to develop things. And, and, you know, I have the professional kitchen experience and it's, it's been an interesting thing because you know we're all this we're all the sum the sum of our decisions you know mm-hmm. so you you are what you have chosen to be over whether you you knew that you were choosing or not and so i have a graduate degree in history so i know how to do research uh, i was a political reporter i was a professional cook so 
I have all of these little skills that I've picked up and they've all kind of come together with Hunter Gardner Cook to allow me to research recipes and test them and write clearly. Um, and then you go out and get the stuff. It's funny because I get, I get people all the time. Like, do you hunt? I'm like, duh. <laughs> <laughs> How am I getting all this meat to try this shit with? Right. Exactly. What's your favorite meal that you cook of all the game? What's your favorite dish? It's really hard to say because it's kind of changes with the weather. Um, I like things with fat. Mm-hmm. I really do. Like the, the, so duck breasts are really high up there on the list. Um, salmon, cause salmon is really fatty. Um, I think there's some weird stuff. Like, uh, I got a chance to hunt chachalacas down by Brownsville in Texas. Tell me about that. Those, Cause that's something I've always wanted to talk about. They are amazing. So they're, they're yet another grouse relative. They're not actually a grouse, but they're damn close. And, and so they're a chicken like bird that lives the farthest North it gets is Brownsville. And it goes all the way down to South America. And they're apparently not terribly athletic because <laughs> <laughs> I killed three of them and they were some of the fattest birds I've ever plucked. And the, the imagine the greatest chicken fat you've ever had. And that's what Chachalaka fat's like. And so I was hooked. You're the only person I know that's ever killed one. And I see them in our Texas book, you know, the hunting mm-hmm. season. You can shoot them X amount of days and stuff. But I don't know anybody that's ever shot one before. Did you hunt them over dogs? No, you can't. Um, so it's not much of a hunt. <laughs> they they live in the thickest, thickest, thickest stuff there is. The And so it's all thorns and poisonous stuff and snakes and, and awful things. And so you can't – we tried. We tried. We tried going after them the what we, what you might call the honest way, which is to go out because the green there's a green blue jay, so it's a green jay um, that lives with them. And so you both these birds are very loud, uh, like the chachalacas are like chicka 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 chicka, and you'll hear them from a long way away. So we would try to get at them, and the green jays would would squawk, and you could hear them. You can get there, but by the time you get there, through all the thorns and and it was just brutal, they would be gone. So what you do is you listen for them and you move to where you think they might cross a clearing Mm -hmm. and then you blast them. And it's, it's, I mean, again, it's not, I mean, it's not hunting quail over dogs in the the great plains or anything as glorious as that, but, uh, (laughs) but it's, it'll, it'll get the job done. They look like a cross between a a turkey turkey. hen and a, 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 a turkey hen and a dove, kind of, or in a hen pheasant. It's a weird. Or in a hen pheasant, it's yeah. A weird look. Jeff's got it pulled up on his computer. It's a weird looking little critter. I've seen them one time in the wild. How big do they get? About the hen pheasant. They're pretty big. Oh, that so is like a, a hen big pheasant size. size. Now the ones these are they're all I can't really see, but they just they look brown. And they uh, I mean, is there way? Is there any way to distinguish between male and female? Mm, I don't know. They all taste the same. And, and so the birds don't, they're, they're not a, a endangered bird. They're just native to just Texas all the way down to the very tip, the southern part of Texas, all the way to South America. Yeah. There's like six or eight different kinds of them. There's lots of different kinds of chachalacas. And yeah, they're not endangered at all. It's just they, they their range only uh, extends into the United States in a, a little bit. It's like the white tipped dove. I shot one of them too down there. The white tip. Dove? We have a few of those here every once in a while. I didn't realize that those were. I didn't know we had those. Not not white wing. Not no, white, white wing. Tip. White tip. Yeah, that we've shot a few of them over the years here and there. Yeah, they've kind of like a rosy breast. Yes. So the the chachalaca. How do you say it? Chachalaca. Chachalaca. Yeah. Chachalaca. Like the, boom chachalaca. <laughs> and that, that, that's that's crazy. So that just that little Cameron County in Texas is the only place that they have them, I guess. Uh huh. Basically, the Mexican border. And. I mean, you, are, you, are you worried about snakes this whole time? I would be freaking out if they're in this nasty bush-looking thing. That's some tough country down there. Because those are big rattlesnakes. Yeah, yeah, no for two reasons. One, you hunt them in the winter, or at least I do. Um, and two, you're you're really walking around senderos. Oh, okay. You know, you're not in the... We very quickly realized that if we were in the thick stuff, yeah, um, bad things could happen. Yeah. So basically, like you said, you just wait for them to cross the sendero, and then you got them. Yeah. How well, did you, you prepare shoot, these? If you can shoot straight. Well, I can't shoot straight, so I would shoot at them. How, <laughs> how did you prepare this? Uh, I plucked them because uh, I, I'm, I'm a, a plucking Jedi and an evangelist for plucking birds. <laughs> and I think 
be, and there's a reason why I do this because the all of the character and the real true flavor of any bird is going to be in the skin and fat. And as we've talked about with Spoonies before, sometimes that character is not very delicious. Right. But if I've never, if I have a new bird, you damn right, I'm going to pluck it because I want to know what it tastes like. And, and there was no reason to suspect that a Tachalaco would be anything other than good because they're a chicken-like bird and all chicken-like birds taste good. And so, and to pluck pretty easy, uh, easier than a grouse. And I made um, Sopa de Lima, which is this Yucatecan dish. It's like a, Imagine Yucatecan uh, chicken soup. What is Yucatecan? Uh, is that Yucatan? Oh, Yucatan. Yucatan is part of Mexico. Yes, like okay. where, yes. Where, Cancun. Where Cozumel is and and uh, and Cancun. We'll be there next month. There nope, you go. Two weeks. I just never heard the term Yucatecan. So that's just a native y- dish y- to y- them. Yucatecan. Okay. So Yucatan is the place, and, and it's something from there is Yucatecan. Okay. Uh, um. So I did that, and then I did a rose con pollo, because you know why not. Um. <laughs> And then I made a stock. And then that's how you ate it. Yep. Scale of but one I to only ten. Had, I only had three, so. Right. Ten, ten out of ten? Oh, yeah. Especially because of the fat. Mm. Like, you know, you get those little beads of fat on the broth, and it's just so good. My, now, that area also, you can shoot some prairie chickens down there in some places. Did you hunt them while you were down there? No, you cannot shoot the, <laughs> you they, can't shoot the Atwater's prairie chicken. I thought they, unless you want to go to jail. I thought there was a season on them. It used to be a season down there. Not in your lifetime. Uh, I don't know. I thought there was. I, there's a, there's somewhere you can shoot prairie chickens on the Texas coast because I've seen it in my guide. Not book. in your lifetime. The, you're talking about the Atwater's prairie chicken, and they are critically endangered and have been since the 70s. So maybe you remember like when you were a kid or something? Yeah, but... that's what. When I was a kid, you could they had a prairie chicken season in Texas. Okay. Yeah, maybe in the 70s or even early 80s, but. Um, I told you I'm 54. Yeah, it, for a long, long, long time, they've been on the endangered list. Why is just, are they not re, re, habitat habitat loss? Yeah. Agricultural practices really ruin their habitat. That's what's so crazy. I mean, the things that we love so much and we chase, they're always on a razor's edge on, I mean, especially like if you look at the pintail, like we're down to, we can shoot one here yeah. and mm-hmm. it's all because of too. the way that they, they choose to nest in Canada. They do, they like to nest on open Open field, so tractors are just mowing them over. They got ninety. Yep. There's ninety Atwater Prairie chickens. There was only fifty, and they're up to ninety now. Yay! Maybe by the time my great grandchildren are are grown, they'll they'll have a season. Be able to shoot them and whooping cranes both together. Yeah. <laughs> I think what are whooping cranes up? They're like five hundred. Isn't that what we discovered on one of the last podcasts? I think somebody you, shot one this year. It made the news again. They shot, they shot four, three or four. Three or oh no! In last Oklahoma year. last year. Ugh. Kind of, kind of around where we hunt. I don't know if it was it's like, a, bro, shoot the gray one, not the white one. You dip with it. Yeah, I don't know if it was like a new hunter that didn't know what he was doing. In 1993, you could actually shoot prairie chickens in Texas. I knew that. Really? My, yeah, I knew that there was. I knew it wasn't that crazy. 93. Yeah. 93, wow. and you could shoot two per person. Good lord. I don't. I don't know anything about the Atwood Prairie Chicken. At water, my At, dad. My dad grew up in Southeast Atwood. Kansas, and he said that was the favorite bird of his to eat was prairie chicken. He's not wrong. Uh, here's here's a crazy thing about prairie chicken meat, and I, I've never gotten anybody to explain this. So, if you pluck a prairie chicken, and you roast a prairie chicken like a chicken, and you cut into that chicken. The meat is looks like uh, thigh meat on a on a supermarket chicken, so it's not it's not light, but nor is it dark. Mm-hmm. If, however, you breast out that prairie chicken, the meat is dark like a duck's. I don't understand it, hmm. and oh. no one's been able. I've talked to meat scientists, I've talked to biologists. No one's the only thing that people have guessed is that it has something to do with either air contact or something. But but if you roast a prairie chicken. That meat looks like, um, you know, you know, yard bird thigh meat. So it's, it's dark but not super dark. That's the best eaten part of a chicken too, is the thighs. Yeah, it is. I've always determined that that's kind of a dating question. So if you're dating someone, <laughs> where do you lie? And, yeah, what part of the chicken is your favorite? And if they say boneless, skinless chicken breast, this could be your last date. <laughs> um, I'm telling you, my wife is the greatest cook in the world. She's a great, great cook. She won't make chicken with a bone in it. And that's my favorite chicken is with a bone in it. 
And she does every once in a while. Not just, with bone. No, she don't. She's fried chicken legs for you before. Very, very few. I can count the number of times on one finger probably. <laughs> and but I I like chicken on the bone. And I'm she buys that boneless, skinless breast. I just I'm just not that I'd much rather have chicken with the but the thighs are the best part. Best chicken yes. there is the thighs. Mm. I can accept any, I can accept lots of different answers except for boneless, skinless chicken breasts. Yeah. <laughs> How long did it take you to get comfortable with mushrooms? Because I would be petrified if I were going out and foraging mushrooms. I, I, I just know I was going to get the one that was going to drop me dead. So it's not rocket science, but nor is it so easy that you can't pay attention. <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, I grew up with it. So there, you learn patterns and the best way to learn about edible mushrooms is from a human being. Because if you and I were walking through the woods and I found an edible mushroom, you could stop and ask me every question you had in your mind and I would be able to answer it. And that will put your mind at ease, at least for that particular mushroom. And then we'll see it 15 other times and then it'll be cemented in your head. I have been doing this for decades and decades and decades. And even now, I will learn new edible mushrooms, not every year, but almost every year. So, And some of these mushrooms are mushrooms that I have walked past for decades. So it's a process, and it's not really hard. It's just you need to be patient. And I think the biggest advice I can give for mushrooming, so like before you know, cook a duck, breasts are like steak and legs are like brisket, with a mushroom, with a mushroom, do this slowly. Do mm. not shoehorn a mushroom that you pick into your mind's eye. This is the biggest mistake that mushroomers do is they think they have a chanterelle, for example. They want it to be a chanterelle. So it's clouding their judgment when they do the, it's called keying out. So you key out the, the characteristics of a mushroom to make sure that it is what you think it is. The biggest mistake new mushroomers have is to, is to kind of, shoehorn in their mind the mushroom that is in their hand to the edible mushroom that they think it is and that's what get people in trouble right see i would be on the opposite end of that i would be i would throw away a lot of good mushrooms because i was a i was afraid that it would be the one bad one that's uh, smarter and and a lot of people do do that the other one that's hilarious so i did a uh <laughs> I did a, a thing about mushroom poisoning, an article some years ago. And so I looked through, there's a hotline and that they keep data. <laughs> so the, the data of this mushroom hotline was the vast majority of mushroom poisonings are not actually mushroom poisonings. They're panic attacks from people who have eaten <laughs> legitimate right. edible mushrooms, but have freaked themselves out. Right. Right. Now, earlier you talked about the Texas or the pecan truffle. That they have those in Texas, correct? Yeah, yeah. I've never dug them, but I know they exist. And, and a truffle you dig because they use a pig in France to sniff up the black truffle. Am I am I right on that, or am I wrong on these? No, they use pigs or dogs. Dogs are better because the pigs do, pigs want to eat the truffle, and you got to fight right. the pig for it. Uh, you can pat the dog on the head, and he'll be okay. So, but <laughs> but they use a dog to smell the truffle, and they dig it up. And I saw some are selling for fifteen hundred dollars a pound. Yep. That's crazy. I'm in the wrong business. It takes a lot of truffles to make a pound of truffles, though. Probably not that many. I've I've had uh, I picked up a three ounce truffle. Really? Mm -hmm. Was that like holding gold in your hand? I mean, if I cared, yeah. But I don't it, really like truffles that much. I've so. I've never. I don't know that I've had a truffle that I've eaten that knocked my socks off. Mm. It's. It's I have described taste. it as kind of the Paris Hilton of ingredients. Everyone wants it, but no one knows why. <laughs> yeah, I just, I don't, I'm not a big, so it doesn't do anything for me. And I, I like mushrooms some. I'm not a big mushroom eater. But, I like mushrooms. But, like, I think it's neat that uh, we have a Facebook closed group. The guys, when mushroom season, that's coming up like March or April, right? The it's turkey season. Yeah. For morels, yeah. And then people go crazy over that stuff. Yeah. I mean, nuts. We don't have them here, so it's not anything I've got to worry about. But well, they have them in Oklahoma. Look, yeah. them, look for them in river bottoms. If you're near Amarillo, they have them there too. Uh, uh, you look for them in river bottoms near cottonwoods. River bottoms near cottonwoods. Now, in there, Amarillo, that's going to be hard to find because there ain't much water up there. There is a <laughs> sorry. <laughs> there is something that looks like a morel that's not a morel. Is this correct? That will grow kind of side by side. Ish. Uh -huh. Um. So. 
if you look up false morel and morel and you look at them, you actually use your eyeballs. You'd be like, those don't look anything like each other. The problem is, this is that shoehorning thing, is people will be like, oh, I got some morel. Like, they don't look anything like each other. They really look nothing like each other. But but people will, but, but because it's this, it's a thing on a stick in the springtime, people are like, it's just like it. Like, really? That's like mistaking a, a red cabbage for a rutabaga. Like, it's just, <laughs> they just don't look the same. Now, what... Have you ever experienced mushroom poisoning? Or is sort it of. Sort of? What happened? So there are a whole... I mean, there's like 10,000 species of mushrooms, yeah. and, and there's hundreds that are edible. So there's a mushroom called the old man... It's like old man in the woods. It's in the bolete family, which is like um, porcini are in the bolete family. So, it, But that family is very big. And it's a black mushroom that's a little... like It looks like it's a, like a black velvet bolete. It's kind of weird. And they live in the East Coast, like in the, and I picked some of these with a friend of mine on Long Island. They are a known edible, so they're not a poisonous mushroom. However, like honey mushrooms and like a, uh, a couple other edible mushrooms, not everybody can eat every mushroom. And so we cooked them up, and that night I felt, it's funny, I didn't barf, I didn't get the shits, uh, but I felt gastrically uneasy <laughs> <laughs> for about, four hours so that's the closest i've been because i'm pretty conservative about what i eat i mean i've eaten amanitas and and i i really want to know my stuff before i'm going to put it in the pan what was the amanita like so there amanitas are i love this family of mushrooms because it is the it's it's like people so there's a bunch that don't do anything there's a bunch that will kill you dead and there's a bunch that i will crawl over glass for oh fuck and and so there's this one particular one that lives out here in the West called Amanita velosa. And uh, the cat looks like a hen's egg, like a Rhode Island red egg. Mm -hmm. And this is the greatest mushroom that I've ever eaten. And I will spend hours and hours looking for them in the springtime. They're, al they're almost here. They should be here in February and March in California. Now and, but you have to know your stuff. You mm -hmm. know, you have to... You have to sit there and calmly look at this mushroom and is it does it meet all of the indicators that you that you know to be this particular mushroom? And if it doesn't meet all of them, don't pick it or don't eat it. Right. And then it's got the it's red and it's got the white on it too, right? That's Amanita muscaria. That's a different species. So don't eat those unless um, you want to like go to another dimension. Uh, yeah, I wish. Um, no, Amanita muscaria. Well, first of all, you can make it edible uh, without hallucinations by boiling it and changing the water three times. Um, and I've done that, and it's fine. Um, and I'll do that if I if I come across like eight trillion of them, and they're all perfect. Sure, I'll do that. But, but generally if, speaking, the the high you get from the red mushroom or the white polka dots, at least in this country, so. Mushrooms are weird in the sense that they're all technically Amanita muscaria, but there's like subvariants. It's a little bit like uh, Canada geese. Mm -hmm. uh, there's yeah. like what? There's 13 different kinds of Canada geese. Yeah, I think 17. Um, uh, there's a bunch. 17. Okay. Lumpers and splitters. Yeah. Um, so the same thing is true with Amanita muscaria. Exactly <clears> the same. So some of them, and most of them here in this country, if you decide, hey man, I'm going to get high from this, you know, polka dot mushroom, what you're going to happen is you're going to vomit your brains out. <laughs> while having bad hallucinations at the same time. So I don't know about you, but that's not exactly my idea of a good time. No, so. I don't want to do that on a Friday night. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I think I'm out on that. Yeah, and like the ones in Europe apparently are different, but this one here is like, it's it's basically stomach cramps, massive vomiting, and then like bad trip. <sighs> I don't, I mean, it's, what's crazy is that these, that there are things out there in nature that will do this to you that you'll have a uh, psychedelic experience on and it's something that grows totally natural. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean the, the, the other kinds of magic mushrooms, the psilocybes. Yeah. Um, that's, that's a whole different animal and yeah, it is. It's kind of amazing. So here's a funny, you might know this. Um, mushrooms are not plants. And so there's three orders of life in the United or in, the, in, in the world. There's, there's animals, there's plants and there's mushrooms and animals are cl more closely related to mushrooms than they are to plants. Right. Yep. I, I've heard that before. And that's what's so, I don't know. Like, that's a whole mind fuck of a deal that 
isn't it? <laughs> that this thing is more like an animal than it is like a plant, and it grows from the earth, just it, like a plant would. Have you seen what Jake Plummer's done? Yeah, he's a big mushroom. Yeah, guy. he's got a big, big. I, I don't know if called a factory, but a farm, I guess. I think his are all psilocybin, though, aren't they? I have no clue. No, Jake the Snake, well, the quarterback for the Cardinals for a long time. And Denver Broncos. Broncos. Oh, well, he better be living in a place where it's legal. Denver. I th- yeah, I think he's living, ah, there in, you go. I think he's <laughs> living in Colorado. When in doubt, go to Denver. But yeah. he said that like mushrooms have totally changed the way, obviously changed the way that he thinks and like he feels better as a person. And uh, He had a pretty bo- good damn good life before that. The body aches that he's taken for, because he had a pretty long career, like, that's all kind of gone away, and it's all he attributes it all to mushrooms. I it's there's some there there. I mean, I'm not an expert at it, but there's definitely some there there. Yeah, I don't know what he's gonna do from there, but hopefully until uh, I, I'm assuming he's got enough money that if this mushroom thing doesn't work out, then he can you know he'll I'm, he'll make it. Yes, he'll make. Well, it. you can hope. I mean, you've seen that ESPN 30 for 30 broke. I didn't where see that something one. like 70 percent of professional athletes are, are go bankrupt at some point. I think those those numbers are changing now because I know that the NFL is getting really good about teaching their rookies about investments, and they have NFL-type uh, investments they can invest in where they have actual financial people. I think that's going to change over the years, but there's no doubt that the, the athlete from the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and even early 90s, well, most of them ended up broke. Well, it's hard, exactly. to, it's hard to tell a kid that's 20 years old, 21, 22, and he gets $3 million. And it's hard to get through his head that you've only got about two or three years of making this kind of money. And you can either set yourself up your next 30 years off of what you make now, or you can blow it all and you can work at Arby's making roast beef sandwiches. I mean, kind of the choice is yours. But they're not doing too good of a job on it because I saw Justin Jefferson and Jamar Chase break down how they spent their first million. Chains were like 60, 600000 That's stupid. Of, well, I didn't say right, they're so part of the 70%. I'll give, you, I'll give you my experience with that. So I used to be a commercial fisherman. Mm-hmm. And so there was a time where uh, we caught we caught enough tuna off the coast of Long Island. And I'm, I'm just about 21 at this point. That my share of that particular trip was $5,000. Mm-hmm. And this is in like 91. So even at that moment, I was smart enough to put my next semester's tuition in the bank and walk away from it. Now, that said, the 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 quality <laughs> the quality of entertainment you could have in in New York City in 1991 with, you know, a couple grand in your pocket um was pretty epic and it's definitely not something I'm going to forget ever. <laughs> um, but <laughs> but even then, I put enough back so that I would, you know, I had that going glimmer of like, yeah, you shouldn't spend all this. Right. Well, but, those guys, th- th- their problem is, is you you knew how you got your money. You had to work to catch that. They don't realize that they got all this money up front as a signing bonus that they're not going to get it again the next year and the next year and the next year. That mm. they they just they don't realize. I don't think a lot of them, and most of them have never had anything in their life. Now, it's going to change now, especially with these kids in college. There are kids going to make more money playing college football than they ever will in pro football. With the NIL. Yes. Isn't that bonkers? Yes. Like, it's so bonkers. Well, the first, now we just <laughs> had the first case come up in Florida. The kid that was going to get $13 million, that deal fell through now. So what's he do now? He wants out of his scholarship now. He wants to go to the next highest bidder, and I don't think it's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen. But it's the Wild West. $13.2 I mean, million, dollars and it fell apart. But then you got a guy like, uh, you know, that, and I, I don't, all I know is what I know about it, which isn't much, but. I think that's the theme of this entire podcast is just enough to be dangerous uh, <laughs> is that a guy like Stetson Bennett. Yeah. That guy should be, you know, taking advantage of NIL because he's not going to play in the NFL. No, not at all. It's, but he's got a national title. He's got two. Yep. Mm-hmm. And he's, and he's going to make more money playing for Georgia. Does he have one more year eligibility left? God, I hope not. He's like 40 already, but he's, gonna no, be he's done. Okay. He's, he's got to be and, done. And he's that, I'll tell you another example is the girl that played softball for OU that, hit a hundred home runs or whatever it was. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hawaii. Mm-hmm. She made six figures last year playing softball at OU. She's done. There's nowhere she's going to go make pro and play. I don't know of a girl's uh, fast pitch league that's pro that's paying much money. I, there may no. be. I don't know, but she's done. She well, you, made, heard, you heard uh, the the Gamecocks, the Lady Gamecocks uh, basketball team. They got boosters to be able to pay every member of the team who's on varsity 
twenty thousand dollars a year. Yeah, it's more. Which I thought it was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, because that's the the, NBA, the WNBA. I think the highest paid player makes two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year, and I, right. why I have no idea because I can't imagine watching that sport. But people do do a little bit. But the money for those kids and athletes, they better make what they can out of college. But the big football players, the the yeah, quarter- but you're talking out of both sides of your mouth now because you're saying that these people should make all the money, but then you're also realizing that. No, I don't think you should pay a college kid. But if they're going to get paid, you might as well make. If you're if you're a college kid right now, you better make what you can because most of them are not going to make pro football money. Well, it just don't happen. I they're, think that they should be. There should be some monetary. Well, they're getting it. Well, yeah. Every kid at SMU gets thirty six thousand dollars. It's on scholarship that plays division football, division one football, or or basketball. Girls and men, men on basketball all get thirty six thousand a year. Eric Dickerson's like, I still got a Trans Am. That's right. No <laughs> shit. <laughs> It's funny, everything, like Reggie Bush, is all the trouble he got into is the same thing now, it's legal. And I think right? they should give him his Heisman back. If of course. You, you took it away because of what is now legal. Did they take O.J. Simpson's away, or does he still have his? Oh, shit. I, he might have sold his. He has extenuating his. circumstances. <laughs> he might have sold his. I don't know. But, or it might have got stolen in that one thing that he stole back. I don't know. That, that, but like he said, he's got extenuating Nothing better than seeing him on Twitter giving someone advice about a court case. Yeah, like, no, no, no. The room. Tone OJ. deaf. <laughs> no, the room. So turkey season's coming up, and we're gonna start wrapping up here because we've we've kept you long enough. Turkey season's coming up. What can you do with the legs? Anything? Uh, they're all absolutely. Ten, they're I, all tendons. So I. So here's my thing. We're allowed three in the spring, uh-huh. and my my iron rule uh, is to shoot the first legal turkey I see first which is usually a Jake. Yep. And I know this is like, this is like blasphemy in the South, but screw them. I don't care. Um, because a Jake, you can pluck and the skin's going to be delicious. Like a, like a Thanksgiving Turkey. Uh, I do like to shoot long beards, but, um, but you know, that's usually, I gotta get a, I gotta get one underneath the belt first. So with a long beard, I'm going to, I'm going to skin it, but a Jake or a hen in the fall, cause you can shoot hens in the fall. Um, and we have, so many turkeys in California. Lucky. Um, what are they? Miriams? So they're mostly Rios, but they're Miriams mixed in. Okay. So there's some hybrids too. The in, so the reason I mentioned plucking is because uh, the greatest part of the actual wild turkey, if you pluck like a Jake or a hand, are the wings. Mm. Because you basically take the wings and you you know you have the drumette and the flat. And then you simmer them to make like, you know, imagine making some turkey stock and you're really only simmering them to make them tender. And then you soak them overnight in whatever makes you happy. Barbecue sauce, you know, salsa, whatever, whatever, just some nice buffalo sauce, you name it. And then you smoke them. So that two step where you have smoke and you have, and they're tender, you have not lived until you have basically sucked the meat off of a, a turkey on that the way you would do a chicken wing at, at, at the football game it, it's amazing it's the best part of the whole turkey and and i'll fight you on this one Ooh, it's so good you just sold me i've never done this before it you have to do that two-step because otherwise it's gonna be hard as nails right and that's the same thing with the legs uh-huh. so skinned or not what i always do with turkeys is i separate the thighs from the drumsticks because the thigh just is the one bone. Right. And you can make that tender and fantastic. There's nothing wrong with a turkey thigh. It, the drumstick is where people get all hung up. Yeah. Be- because the bird spends all its time walking, the tendons in a drumstick will never break down. You have to just live with it. So drumsticks go by themselves because those are crockpot fuel. Like that's what you use. You shred that meat. Mm-hmm. So it, they'll get tender. Everyone's like, oh, you're hard as nails. Well, you just didn't cook it long enough. Sometimes, I mean, I got a really nice Rio this past year. It was, God, I think it was a 21 pound Rio, which Ooh, is big shit. for a Rio. Yeah, that's huge. And it had a big old long beard, and I'm sure it was probably three years old or more, maybe. And it was tough as nails. It took four and a half hours for it to fall off the bone, but it did. So, and in many cases, people think that something should be done in an hour or two hours, and it's just not the case with wild game. It, you just have to go with it with wild game, and it will eventually get tender. It always will. 
Trust me on this one. So then when it is, when it is falling off the bone, I mean, it's as simple as putting turkey drumsticks in a crock pot, cover it with chicken broth or turkey broth if you've made it, and go put, turn it on and go to work. Come back eight, nine hours later, and it'll be good. Right. You can shred that off the, off the bone, use it however you want. You can put barbecue sauce on it. You can put it in tacos. You can, what I like to do is I will shred it off, and then I will take some, you know, fresh rendered lard like you get in a Mexican market. You know, the stuff that's in the refrigerator yeah. and lay some of that lard down and get that nice and hot and lay the, the shredded turkey meat down on that, on the hot cast iron pan and sear just the one side so that it's crispy on one side and super tender on the other. And that's, you can't beat that. No, that sounds fantastic. Um, how did you said it took four hours? What do you do? Are you like, are you opening the lid and like trying to see if it'll fall off the bone periodically? Is that how you know? Like yeah, I it, won't that, even check until I'm at the two and a half hour mark. Right, right. So at two and a half hours, and you that's, check, that's see how Dutch tender oven. it is. What's that? Yeah, that's in a Dutch oven at like 300 degrees. The crock pot's going to take most of the day. Right. So that's why you say put it on the morning, come back, come back after work and you'll yep. be good to go. Um. I just like, I like, I like the, I like the, I like the nuggets. I like doing the nuggets and then you fry it and then you fry. Nuggets I, are great for the breast. I, yeah, yeah. I always do, uh, I'll get, uh, shit. What are, oh, I just get biscuits. And then when my oil's hot, I'll throw the biscuits in first and then we eat, uh, hot basically, you know, and then you put powdered sugar or not powdered sugar, uh, cinnamon or, uh, brown sugar, a little bit of honey on it while your turkeys are cooking. So that's always what we do at my house. Kids love it. That's a cool, that's like a breakfast. Yeah, yeah, you know, you're standing, you know, your oil's already hot, so you throw these little biscuits in there. and so you're making donuts. Basically making donuts. And the kids go bonkers over it. And then I get them all hopped up on the sugary shit, and then I get to eat most of the turkey nuggets because I love them, and I don't like to share them. Didn't you do it with the uh, jalapeno brine, too? Yeah, yeah, so I got... Uh, pickle, pickle brine fried... Poultry is God's gift. Yes, it is. There's and a, I didn't. I was not aware of that this was even a thing until like two years ago. I'll I'll throw one at you, and I'm not a chef by any means, but I grew up in Wichita Falls, and we had a place called the Chicken Box, and they used to do fried they fried chicken is what they did. Is that a strip club or a restaurant? No, it's an old it's, it was an old black old black man's fried chicken joint, but it was good. But anyways. He would do fried chicken, but they would take wax paper and they would take jalapeno peppers, pickled jalapeno peppers. They had them in a crock pot there with the juice. And when you ordered your chicken and you said, you tell them you want it baptized, which was dipped. And they would take wax paper, put your chicken in there and take a ladle out and put that jalapeno juice in there and shake it up in there. And that skin would absorb all that, that chicken and then dump it out. It's the best fried chicken I've ever had in my life. I'd eat that. I'd eat that. That sounds a little bit like, um, um, like uh, Nashville hot chicken a bit. It, it, well, it's, it's, it's wet. It's, it's wet, but it's it's just jalapeno juices. None of the oils and stuff. But it is the mm. best fried chicken I ever had. But it's called they called it dip chicken. But you tell me you want it baptized, and they put that wax paper and put whether it was strips or breast and wings and thighs. But that old that jalapeno juice in there would soak all that skin up. Oh, that shit was good. I'd eat that. It's, it's the damn, way to go. Damn good fried chicken. Yep. Well, listen, we have kept you long enough. This has been a lot of fun. Like you said, we knew just enough about a lot of stuff just to be dangerous. Um, I don't know. There was a bunch of stuff I didn't get to, but we've kept you long enough. Uh, we'd like to have you on again sometime. It's been a lot of fun. Sure. Um, yeah, happy to. What uh, what you, what do you got uh, planned for the rest of your hunting season? You got any big trips? Are we going after anything? Or are you just waiting for spring to roll around? I'm kind of waiting for spring at this point. Um, I'll probably try and kill myself a turkey, and then fishing season starts, and uh, and you know, this is draw season. So I'm putting in for my annual raft of, of big game draws out West that I won't get drawn for. Uh, <laughs> I I've had terrible luck over the last four or five years, but you know, I'll make it happen. Yeah. Oh, real quick. What's your favorite salmon recipe? We've, I've made salmon and my wife hates it. And it's usually just in a, in a pan oil and, you know, kind of, it's real hard to beat smoked salmon, smoked salmon. I'll try it. Yeah. So another one is, um, are you just buying salmon or are you catching salmon? Well, I buy it because <laughs> we don't have no salmon we're a here. long way away from the. No, I mean, ocean. I didn't know if you went to Alaska or something. No, uh, no, 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 no. It's all store-bought. If you're buying salmon, ugh, um, your first tip is this. Never buy so-called fresh salmon. Okay. Only buy frozen salmon and thaw it out. It's going gonna, it's gonna to have less smell. Okay. Really? Yeah. Because typically when you buy frozen salmon, 
it was frozen in Alaska. Okay. Oh, that's the other one. Buy Alaskan salmon. Alaskan salmon. Um, yeah, don't buy don't buy farmed shit because it's smellier. Right. Um, buy Alaskan salmon that's frozen in the market and then thaw. The, here's a trick on how to thaw any fish, salmon especially, uh, but any fish will like this. Okay, I want to eat salmon tomorrow. Take it out of the freezer. Take it out of the package. Wrap it in paper towels and put it in a container in the in the fridge. And then the next morning. Uh, that salmon or fish will have started to thaw, change the paper towels. Mm -hmm. The smell goes with the paper towels. Hmm. So then when it's you're ready to cook that night, it will be thawed and it will have you will minimize whatever smell might be there. I will and, do that. And Dan. that's will go a long way to your your wife and everybody else liking the fish because it's salmon gets a stink on it if you don't treat it exactly right. Yeah. And I think that's what and we've had we you know, just like any, that's like, that was like the only fish that we could like half-ass afford that wasn't like catfish or anything like that. So I'll, I'd eat, I'd eat catfish over farm salmon every, any day. <clears throat> really? Would yep. you just fry it? Cause that's how we always have it in Texas. Or blackened. Blackened Fried, catfish. Fried, blackened. It's good. Like look for Vietnamese recipes because the Vietnamese eat a lot of sam or uh, catfish. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of good recipes there. Um, you know, if I'm, if I'm eating catfish, I'm going to look for Cajuns, yeah. just Southern fried. Um, by the way, pickle brined fried catfish, you're welcome. Never I'll even heard that. of that before. That's actually, actually, I'm not a big catfish here, but that actually sounds pretty good. Anything pickle brine, you've got me on. Because, yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's remarkable. I did, uh, I did uh, uh, Nashville hot, my own not Nashville hot chicken, and that was phenomenal. And I did, that's how I did my uh, turkey breast last time, pickle brined it. Yep. Fantastic. We got, we got some coon asses that hunt with us, and they do fried fish. And for their wet ingredient, they use Louisiana mustard. hot sauce. And they also use mustard, too, quite a lot in uh, south of I-10. I didn't know that. But they, the guys here yep. always use a hot sauce for their wet ingredient. Boy, it's really good, too. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I, I support that. Best food in the world right there down there in southern Louisiana. All right. I don't know about that, but it certainly is. I mean, it it's, it is, in my opinion, the best um, American regional cuisine. So it's the most defined. It's the most refined and it's the most developed american regional cuisine is is cajun and creole i i, I they're different but I, I i put them as adjacent very good food very good food well we sure appreciate you being on here you've been a wonderful guest and been a lot of fun we'd love to have you on again thank you and god bless you and have a great spring and good luck on the mushrooms yeah yeah thank you thanks for having me on yes sir thank you. um if there's anything we can ever do for you just give us a shout love to love to chat more um all right be good have a good luck this spring all right, bye. Interesting man. Hank Shaw from, you can find him on Instagram. Hunt, gather, cook is his IG handle. So if you, and it's all one word, hunt, gather, cook. He's got a blue check mark, unlike me. Son of a bitch, he's making his own wine, and I meant to talk to him about that and bison and. Have him on again then. There's a whole we have bunch of stuff. Probably there. be a great summer guest for us. But. Any way we're gonna have Trevor and Alex on next week talk about uh, snow goose calls and turkey season. I'm ready for turkey season. And I'll, it can't be any worse than last turkey season. Alex is gonna be at Nashville, and I will be at Nashville. I'll be at the boss booth. Come by and say hi, and come and talk to us and get Michelle's autograph. I reckon that's surely they're flying. Who? The Pacific guys. Jeff and Jell are the Pacific guys. I don't know, but we are. Make uh, somebody else drive all that stuff out there what i would do i bet you they're driving because they got all that shit Oof. a long way to go that's rough they drove freaking from game fair yeah remember we got home on our long drive and we still beat them <laughs> yeah all right thank y'all right. for listening to us god bless y'all have a great week bye bye check out our sponsors go check out double t british kennels ducks unlimited dirty duck coffee stanfield hunting outfitters bangtail whiskey alf outdoor specialties the hunt proof app looking glass podcast lucky duck shin gear waiters not just a waiter company gun dog outdoors pacific calls dive bomb industry boss shot shells and mossberg